Welcome back to the Nick Bartlett Show, everybody. And we're still in the midst of interviewing media and uh, other personnel from Super West teams and their uh, non-conference opponents. And for today's edition, we'll be previewing the Fresno State-Arizona State game. And so today I got someone a little bit different than a beat writer. Um, helping me on the show today is Paul Leffler, who's the Fresno State play-by-play -play announcer and probably better known as the voice of the Bulldogs. So yeah, guys, got a little West Coast affair here today. I'm in Seattle. Um, Paul's down in Fresno. So uh, thank you for coming on the show. Hey, my pleasure. It's a lot of excitement around here for the season coming up. Definitely, definitely. So um, what are kind of your initial thoughts on Fresno State considering uh, all they lost? They lost a lot of pieces on um, the offensive side of the ball. They did. You know, they lost their quarterback and their playmakers in the backfield and in the receiving core. But what they didn't lose is their head coach, Jeff Tedford, who not only is, you know, at the top of the list in college football, really, with his track record, what he's been able to do, especially considering what he has to work with at different stages. But he also has a tremendous coaching staff, very experienced coaching staff, very engaged coaching staff. And I think that made a huge difference last year in Fresno State riding the ship. I mean, they were one and four, ended up 10 and four. No team in college football had ever done that before. That's pretty historic. It's pretty significant. And so now, you know, they, they go into the opener at Purdue with the third longest win streak in the country. Will it still be intact when they get the Tempe in mid-September? We'll see. But right now, that's where they stand. And there's a lot of confidence, a lot of momentum here. Uh, there's, I think, a lot of assurance that the defense is going to be outstanding again, as it was last year when they were top 10 in the nation and fewest points allowed. And hopefully that gives the offense a little time to develop with a new leader behind center. Definitely. And um, one thing I think uh, we may have touched on just talking a little bit beforehand was you're speaking how the coaches were the right guys for uh, Fresno's culture. Could you speak a little bit uh, more to that? Yeah, you know, you don't see it everywhere in college football because it has become so much of a, a transitory business, right? People are always trying to look uh, to move up, to get a bigger payday. But Jeff Tedford's here because he wants to be, because he played here. He was an assistant coach here under two legends, Jim Sweeney and Pat Hill. Uh, he came back here as head coach because he loves the community. And the second time around, you know, he stepped away for two years because of health problems and Kalen DeBoer did a great job and, and he may win the Pac-12 or the Pac-whatever this year. Uh, but Jeff Tedford is back with a new coaching staff that has a little different flavor. You look at Kevin Coyle, defensive coordinator who's been in the game longer than Jeff has, who had been an assistant here previously to Pat Hill. Um, you know, John Baxter, one of the best special teams coaches in the country who dominated that part of the game in the pack previously and had a great run here with Pat Hill before. Jethro Franklin is his D-line coach, who is one of the all-time great defensive linemen at Fresno State. Tim Skipper, linebacker coach, same story, linebacker at Fresno State. J.D. Williams in the secondary, All-American at Fresno State. Top to bottom, this is a staff that not only has the expertise and the ability to teach fundamentals, but understands why this program means something to this community. So it really is a unique situation. I think every program would love to have that. Every program that has a hint to that wants you to believe it's sincere and they're all here for the long haul. But from my view, this staff that's here right now really carries that quality. And you know they, they want to be here. They want to stay here. They want to win here. And when you have all those things converging, I think you get results like last year where against every imaginable ounce of adversity, they found a way to stay focused, to power through, to do something great. And you can feel that momentum a little bit roaring into this season. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, that's something um, just I may be a little different. I think just coming from Seattle, I've always kind of been curious about the Fresno culture because it is different. It has kind of has kind of like a, just a cool element to it, um, kind of like a fighting spirit. And I think I, I've always just kind of I felt that way a little bit. I mean, I don't know anything. I'm not a part of it, but it just kind of felt a little maybe it just felt a little different than other programs but um getting to actual um football here um so i guess we talked uh touched on uh what are your initial thoughts um so is it going to be possible to replace jake hayner um did uh logan fife kind of do enough to give you hope i know he had that one pretty meaningful game against san jose state um but outside of that there wasn't uh too much 
Yeah, I mean, great question. And can you replace Jake and expect similar results? No. I mean, let's be honest. The guy had a phenomenal year, uh, the most accurate passer in Fresno State history. And when you're coming in behind guys like, you know, Trent Dilfer and, and Kevin Sweeney and Billy Bullock and especially David and Derek Carr, who just obliterated the record book, and you break some of their records, you're doing something pretty special. But Jake did not become the Jake Hayner we saw last year overnight, right? It took time for him to grow into that. He needed some reps. He needed some time in the saddle. Logan got some valuable experience last year. Um, he had some difficult ones to swallow. I mean, they lost a game at Connecticut they never should have lost. And, you know, Logan had a critical turnover in that game that never should have happened, where the ball just slipped out of his hand and went backwards, and the Huskies recovered. I think without that play, even Fresno State probably wins that game. So he had some growing pains, but one thing he demonstrated is that he's fearless, that he's confident, he's not afraid to take a hit, he's not afraid to run with the ball, he has a grasp of the offense, he's been in this offense with Coach Tedford longer than anybody else in the program. So those are all the things he has going for him, and I think some would argue that in the spring, he outplayed the transfer from Central Florida, Mikey Keene. Now, this Arizona State game is going to be huge if Mikey's the quarterback because he was a dominant high school force in the greater Phoenix area. So that would be a homecoming game for him if he's the starter. And I think he believes he will be. And Logan believes he will be. And the fall competition is going to be really intense and hopefully really constructive where you end up going into the season saying, hey, there's two guys that I have a lot of trust in, but this one guy did enough to say, hey, I'm the one who can move the team down the field efficiently, who can take care of the football, and who maybe has a little extra it factor to lead the team to victory. Definitely, definitely, yeah. And you touched on um, transfer of uh, Mikey Keene. Um, yeah, so that, that should be a good battle. I mean, it seems like probably, you know, a um, pretty good problem to have. Obviously, replacing Hayner is not going to be, um, you know, easy. But, um, you know, having someone with a little bit of experience helps in a, a pretty high-profile transfer. Um, so also, I think maybe lesser known with all the hype around Hayner last year, um, how do you replace the production of Jordan Mims? Um, I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize he ran for basically uh, over 1,300 yards and um, 18 touchdowns. He had a phenomenal year. And, it, you know, those are the stats that jump off the page. But he also really improved in pass protection, uh, really changed his body, uh, was great out of the backfield. And I think his maturity – and his resilience. There are a lot of guys on that team. You know, this has been an interesting era of college football because of the pandemic and what it led to. So Mims was one of those guys who was in the program for six years, you know, and he had to miss an entire year to injury. And then you had the COVID thing. So he was a completely different young man last year than, you know, say when he came to Fresno State. For much of his career, he was kind of overshadowed by Ronnie Rivers, who's in the NFL now and broke a lot of records. And part of the equation to replacing Mims, or at least trying to, is Ronnie Rivers' little brother, Devin Rivers, who was a, an outstanding high school running back. He's undersized. I mean, if you saw the team walking through the airport, you're not going to say, hey, that's your starting running back. But I would not be shocked at all if he got in the mix with some carries because, you know, much like his older brother, he's a Rivers. Their dad played in the NFL. They've, they've grown up with the game. So you say a freshman and a little guy, well, no, on the inside, it's like a fifth-year senior in terms of his knowledge of the game, his feel for spacing, reading holes, and, and finding the opening, and the maturity is there. So he'll be a piece of it. You know, Malik Sherrod was Mims' backup last year, had some big moments, scored a nice touchdown in the Coliseum against the Trojans, where, you know, he's a Southern California native. That was huge. He's got speed. He has great change of direction, good hands out of the backfield. I think he'll get the first crack at it. But there are some other intriguing possibilities there. Elijah Gilliam's a more physical back who got some reps last year. They brought in the transfer from Cal, Damian Moore, who they know can run between the tackles. And there's a guy who just hasn't been healthy yet, but is a pretty good blend of power and speed named Jonathan Arsenault, who's also kind of chomping at the bit to get out there. So much like quarterback, running back's a position that's going to be hotly contested in fall camp. Yeah, that's. Uh, I didn't realize there were uh, that many options. Um... Yeah, and so, so kind of hop, it's like, it feels like the kind of the theme. I feel like a lot of people don't realize that um, Fresno State actually has uh, three players on NFL rosters who were a uh, water squad last year. Said that, that was the most circle way of saying that. But um, basically, how in the world, I mean, seriously, how does Fresno State 
they replace Austin um, with the fourth actually going to with a fourth player transferring out um, and going to my alma mater, Washington State. How do you replace uh, those four receivers? Yeah, Josh Kelly, I think, will be an impact player uh, for the Cougars at Washington State. I mean, he was a, a great combination of, of speed and hands and physicality. Uh, he has NFL potential, so I, I hope that's a good home for him. You know, I, I think he kind of got overshadowed last year because Jalen Moreno Cropper had such a phenomenal year, and he's wowing him in Cowboys camp right now. He was the speed guy. Nico Remigio came in as a grad transfer from Cal and had an immediate impact in the return game as a tough receiver, you know, in the slot, taking those hits over the middle, outstanding hands, and his leadership, his maturity, his connection with Hayner, that was a huge key. Nico's on the short list of MVP candidates for last year's team. And then you had Zane Pope, right? I mean, here's a guy who was just as dependable as they come, had a heartbreaking moment in the UConn game where he dropped Fife's Hail Mary, right in his, Fife's Hail Mary right in his hands. But then he comes back, and he's the hero of the San Diego State epic comeback where Fresno State scored 15 points in 13 seconds and stole a game the dogs had no business winning. Um, you know, again, outstanding. So those three guys were all really good. Eric Brooks was part of that crew and maybe the guy who really drove the consistency of that group, right? He's a former walk-on who's had game-changing catches in the Rose Bowl against UCLA. Now he's the senior. He's back for another year. And his work ethic, his investment, the way he carries himself, I think that sets the standard for that whole receiving core. And there's a lot of talent in that receiving core. I can tell you, they brought in a couple transfers. You know, Jalen Gill from the ACC, also from the Porter, Mikel Barkley. They have a young man, Josiah Freeman, who sat out last year, who everybody says, man, when he gets the ball in his hands, look out. He's going to be maybe the new Jalen Moreno Cropper. Um, and that's not even the full list. Jalen Moss has been picked by somebody as the preseason freshman of the year in the conference because he's such a talented wideout. Acevedo uh, another guy who's real shifty. So they have a lot of options. And I think the, the receiving option that might end up turning more heads than any of those wideouts is their tight end, Trey Watson. I mean, he's going into his third year, but he hasn't had a full healthy season yet. His blend of athleticism, speed, size, strength, you can leave him on the field for pass protection, but in the passing game, he's a great route runner, and he's a matchup problem. I mean, he, he's so big and so long with his wingspan. His catch radius is huge, and he's really tough on a linebacker if he get, you know, gets stuck covering him. So I think a healthy Trey Watson this year becomes a, a primary option in the pass game for Fresno State. We've seen that before from Jeff Tedford in some of his offenses. I think the tight end position is going to be featured very heavily this year. Definitely. You said uh, Trey Watson? Trey Watson. He's, uh, he's a big-time player. And they have some depth behind them. I mean, they have some other tight ends. One of their new tight ends is actually the son of Bulldog legend David Carr, Derek's nephew. So that's going to be fun. Um, but, yeah, Trey Watson is the guy who, if he stays healthy, defenses are going to have to find a, an, an answer for him. And I don't, you know, I don't want to say that so much that I give the guy a complex that he can't stay healthy. He's just had a couple injuries. That happens to everybody. But, you know, he's 6'5", great wingspan, can jump, and terrific personality, too. And, by the way, I've seen firsthand he's got a, a pretty smooth left-handed stroke on his jump shot. So I mean, he's an athlete. All right, I'm a, I may be on like a little bit less sleep than I prefer, so I could talk to you about basketball all day. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to keep it on a uh, football. But um, no, I mean that's that's cool. And having a tight end, um, in all seriousness, should be a nice security blanket for whoever does win the starting job. Um, just some quick little routes over the middle, that sort of thing. Um, all right, I think we've done a pretty good job of kind of talking about the offense here. Um, is there anything you want to um add about the offensive line or um? Anything about ASU, anything like that? Just, uh, yeah, your call here. Well, it'll be interesting with ASU. You know, the last time Fresno State played the Devils, it was uh, the bowl game in Vegas. And Ronnie Rivers ran for over 200 yards. And, and Marcus McMarion led the Bulldogs to victory. That was 2018. And that was a 12-win season. And, and Bulldog fans remember it. And I think they've been looking forward to this chance to travel to Tempe to see this game. And, you know, they didn't know that it would be a first-year head coach they're going up against. And by that time, it'll be week three, so they'll have a better feel for what the new-look Devils are, are going to do. But anytime Fresno State 
gets a chance to take on a Power 5 school, it's a big deal. You alluded to it earlier. There is something special about Fresno and the Valley. It's distinct from the rest of California. It's, you know, hardworking people. We grow all the food. I mean, you're eating stuff in Seattle today that got grown here, and it's really good. I mean, I can go to Fresno State right now. They've got an on-campus farmer's market that the students grow the food for, and you'll find the best tomatoes in the world and some jalapenos that'll knock your socks off and some table grapes, and their sweet corn is world famous. I mean, it, it's a unique place, and it, it has its distinct flavor, no pun intended. Fresno and the Valley, they're not trying to be San Francisco or L.A. You know, it's its a different culture. And from the sports landscape, it's been decades of being the little stepbrother to the Cals and Stanfords and UCLA's and USC's of the world. So when they get a chance to play on that stage against one of the teams that has a budget that dwarfs theirs, that has all the advantages they wish they have, they don't squander that opportunity. Jeff Tedford will have them focused. He'll have them ready. But you asked about offensive line. I think in this ASU game, it's really going to come down to the trenches, to how this Fresno State offensive line plays and how a defensive line that lost its best pass rusher is performing early in the season. So I think their depth on the offensive line is going to be good. They had a change at offensive line coach, and you probably know that because last year's offensive line coach is now Arizona State's offensive line coach. So that'll be a fun reunion for some of those guys in the devil game. But I'm intrigued to see the offensive line and the defensive line to see the depth and to see who steps forward to be a leader. On the offensive line, it's pretty clear. It's Mose Vaval, the veteran. He gets them going, right? He sets the tone. On the defensive line, Devo Bridges terrorized your Cougars in the bowl game, was named MVP of the Jimmy Kimmel L.A. Bowl. He's a guy with position versatility that's played inside and outside on that D-line and kind of a mismatch because he's got size, but more speed than you expect for the size of that body. And I think he's poised for a breakout year. They brought in a recruit, Ezra Christensen, who I'm really intrigued to see in fall camp that's supposed to be you know, a high-quality athlete. And they have a few guys that have played. I mean, they were very young on the D-line last year, but very deep. And they do a good job of rotating defensive linemen to keep them fresh. So while a lot of teams, I mean, I might prep for four or five D linemen that I know are going to play and a few that might play with Fresno state. I mean, I, a lot of games I have 10 to 12 defensive linemen on my spotting board. Cause I know they're all going to get in the game and contribute. Yeah. I mean, and that's going to be necessary trying to replace uh, David Perales. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, he was absolute, uh, monster i do i picked the um like the players of the week um for whatever reason they let me do it and it felt like every single week i had to look at his box score it just it would like jump out it was something like absurd like video not video game numbers i need a new cliche but you get what i'm saying yeah so um i think we uh so you touched on the d line there so yeah let's hop down to my defensive questions um touched on just kind of a general question um i think you touched on it at the top so maybe just a little bit of clarification you, you said you feel like the defense is probably going to be um, good this year. If I'm misquoting you, please tell me. Um, so how do you feel they will kind of replicate the success of last season? I think the defense is going to be outstanding. Um, and the biggest reason is Fresno State has the best pair of cornerbacks in the Mountain West by far, and maybe the best on the West Coast. And, and I know people could guffaw at that, but watch the film. I mean, watch what Cam Lockridge and Carlton Johnson did for the second half of last year. Carlton Johnson was a guy nobody knew about. He was a junior college transfer who probably would have played a lot in the early games, but he had this freak accident in the weight room. He wasn't supposed to be in there working out, and he dropped a dumbbell on his foot, and that cost him half the season. But once he came in, he was dominant. I mean, it was a no-fly zone. He's got great length. He's got a swagger to him. And Cam Lockridge on the other side had already proven himself in the league, a transfer from Hawaii. He had some huge interceptions. They both have pick six ability. So when you know you can take away the outside, right? And now they have some depth behind those guys too. They did lose Evan Williams transferring to Oregon, following in the, the footsteps of his brother Bennett and kind of just taking that spot. But they brought in a transfer from Kent State named Dean Clark, who's a, probably a more physical safety than Evan. And they have a lot of confidence that, that he's ready to deliver. So the secondary is great, right? The linebacking core, 
the two backups in the linebacking core, this 4-2-5 right now, are USC transfers. And they're the backups because Lavelle Bailey is a, a senior who's as versatile as anybody in the league, can stop the run, can drop back in coverage, can rush the passer, great length, great athleticism. He's got that basketball player's body control, you know, so he can swivel the hips, he can reach back and knock something away. Just a really unique athlete. I like to compare him to a friend of mine that, that Pac-12 fans remember by the name of Donnie Edwards. I mean, Donnie Edwards, you couldn't pigeonhole him into run stopper, pass rusher, coverage guy. He's got more interceptions than any linebacker in the history of the game, but he could also come off the edge and sack a guy. He's an all-pro, he's a legend, but he was unique. He was kind of a, a unicorn in the, the combination of that skill set. And Lavelle is very similar in his body type and his skills. You know, Malachi Langley was a, the hammer, the guy who put his head down and knock you back a little bit, and he's back. I mentioned the USC transfers. Uh, and Phoenix Jackson is a young man not a lot of people know, but has made great strides. So they're deep at linebacker. And, you know, in that 4-2-5, the nickel is an important position. Last year, that was Maurice Norris, who kind of have a breakout season. We'll see where they play him this year. I think in year two, and the biggest reason I say their defense is going to be great is Kevin Coyle is a mastermind. He's one of those guys that once players get time in his system and they know the speed of it and the reaction time is where it should be, they're not playing catch up, all of a sudden he starts getting a little more aggressive. He'll move guys around. You never know where the pressure's coming from. He's great at disguise. He keeps quarterbacks off balance. And this year it's, hey, no more baby steps. We're all in because we know the system and we're ready to come at you and hit you in the face. And I think that's what that defense is going to do this year. And I wouldn't be shocked at all if you see games where the opposition, you know, is held under 20 points, uh, maybe even under 10, maybe even a couple shutouts here and there. I think that's how much confidence this defense has going into the year. It was going back to one of your first points. Uh, you're not the first uh, Fresno State um uh, I, I should say affiliate um, to kind of hype up the cornerback combination. I was listening to um, a little podcast, you know, in preparation of this, and I heard the exact same thing from a, another Fresno State writer um, in regards to the cornerback combination. Yeah. And so I think that should prove um, interesting. I haven't really touched on ASU too much because, like I said, there's really, unfortunately, not too much. But the one thing we do know of them is they have a really good receiving core um, in Elijah Badger, uh, Jalen Connors. They also have a guy by the last name Saunders who I'm blanking on. And uh, their quarterback in Drew Pine, be, uh, J uh, Rashada or um, Trenton Borgay, whoever it may be, they do three reasonable options. You can't say super proof, but reasonable enough where they could do something. So I think um, Fresno State's secondary versus uh, ASU's receiving course could be um, maybe kind of a second kind of thing to focus on in the matchup. You're talking about the trenches, maybe the focal point, but maybe a kind of point B there. Um, and so yeah. I think you touched on – sorry, were you going to say something there? No, I just agree with you. Yeah, I, I, I think you made a great point. That is going to be a critical matchup, and especially uh, as early as the, in the season as it comes and as maybe unproven or relatively inexperienced as whoever the quarterback is going to be is at that point. I mean, that connection between quarterback and receiver – and, and that secondary's ability to disrupt it. Because when you have the secondary that good and that confident, it gives the coordinator the courage to take a few more chances with the pressure. And I think that's where the turnovers come from, right? And I think Fresno State's gonna be well equipped to create those kind of scenarios. Definitely, and assuming even with uh, um, receivers I just mentioned, Pine top to bottom, if he is the starter, probably won't have the talent like you had at Notre Dame. So good secondary with maybe a little drop off in the players he's throwing to uh could spell a little trouble for the Sun Devils. Um, so let's see here. Um, kind of a big, big stat. One of the biggest stats. Um, basically what can Fresno state do to stop the run this year? Last year, they were nine and zero when holding teams under when holding teams to under 165 yards on the ground and two and four when they didn't. Yeah. And, and a good chunk of that damage was done in the first half of the season, right? Uh, Oregon State ran the ball successfully against Fresno State. Boise State in their first meeting ran the ball extremely well against Fresno State. Now, part of that equation, I mean, this this sounds a little you know counterintuitive, but part of that is 
Fresno State struggles on offense at the time, not the Oregon State game, but the Boise State game, you know, they're playing a backup quarterback who's got no experience and they couldn't sustain drives. So then your defense is tired and then the defense has a harder time stopping the run and, and the snowball builds in a hurry. But by the second half of that season, it was hard to run or pass against Fresno State. So I, I don't think there are any schematic flaws that they have to deal with. Um, they also were very young on the interior D-line last year, starting a couple true freshmen at times, including one from the Phoenix area, speaking of the ASU game. Um, so they have more experience. They definitely have depth. I think they'll have a pretty good solution for the run this year. And part of that is just the, the mental understanding, the game planning, and fitting that in with the scheme. So again, they've got the grasp of a new coordinator's scheme that they didn't have for the first half of last year. And I think that'll make a big difference. Definitely. All right. Um, so if you kind of cover it all, do you have a game prediction? I know it's early. It's uh, You can say no. Um, so you got a game prediction this early? Well, the, the challenge is not knowing what happens in the two games before that. So, and especially in the Purdue game, you know, Fresno State opens up at Purdue, another team with a, a first time head coach. So he'll be coaching his first game ever as a college head coach against Jeff Tedford, who's one of the more experienced guys in the game. If Fresno State wins that game on the road against a Big Ten team and backs that up the next week, you know, at home against Eastern Washington, which would be a game people expect Fresno State to win. Then I see Fresno State, you know, heading down to the desert with a whole lot of momentum and a whole lot of confidence. And if it's Mikey Keene at quarterback, it's a homecoming game, right? He's from that area and didn't end up playing there, didn't have the offers from the Pac-12. So all of a sudden, the, the tapestry and the, the plot lines thicken a little bit. But I do think Fresno State's going to be a, in a good position going into that game. I think it's one they've circled for a long time. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Fresno State finds a way to beat the Devils. And if the Bulldogs do, uh, I think two things. One, the defense is going to create takeaways and really fluster Arizona State. Just, I mean, I think they're well equipped to do that. And two, special teams will play a role. John Baxter is a special teams wizard. Last year, the analytics said he had the most efficient special teams unit in the country. And they lost the best return man in the conference in Remigio. He's gone. Who's going to step into that role? Might be Eric Brooks, you know, a veteran receiver. But when it comes to special teams, John Baxter is one of those guys who creates a culture around it where the best players on your team want to be on kick coverage. They want to be in the return game. They want to be blocking for extra points because he makes it such a priority. And I could see a special teams play turning the tide in a, in a you know, pretty evenly matched game between Fresno State and Arizona State. So yeah, that's my perspective on it. But a lot can change between now and September 16th. I hear you. I hear you. Was there, was there a score? Did I miss that? Or were we sitting with the, uh, oh, with the score? special teams? No, wow. uh, you, you don't. Again, only if you're comfortable. I don't want to give anybody a bulletin board material. I, I, it would be a lot easier to probably peg a score after we see both teams the first couple of weeks, especially I think Arizona State is is a huge unknown with all the portal guys and a new head coach and all that. But I would guess that you know Fresno State's defense should be able to to hold the Sun Devils in the twenties, if not lower. So I mean, I wouldn't be surprised at all at a, a game where you know Fresno State is scoring 25 to 29 points and the devils have less than that but that's about as far as i should go on that i think fair, fair enough no i appreciate it. we'll take we'll take the special teams in the uh, low 20s um or i should say mid 20s um so i guess uh yeah just with everything going on um in the college football landscape is there anything you'd like to add about fresno state um this game or yeah just college football in general yeah i mean what a wild time um I don't think, you know, it's realistic to say neither team absolutely knows what conference it's going to be in uh, 365 days from now, right? I mean, that's just the wacky situation that we're in. I will say Fresno State has proven it can compete between the lines, right? I mean, I, I had the privilege of college, uh, calling a, a national championship for the baseball team that went through Arizona State when they upset the Sun Devils at the old Packard Stadium uh, a Sun Devil team that was probably the best team they played all year that year. 
just to go to Omaha. Then they won the whole thing. They've proven in baseball. At times, they've proven in basketball. Paul George is an alum of the NBA. Orlando Robinson just dominated the summer league. And in football, I mean, consistently, whether it's Jim Sweeney or Pat Hill or Jeff Tedford, they've taken on the big boys, the guys who have a football budget that's bigger than Fresno State's entire athletic budget, and they've beaten them between the lines. So they've proven that they can compete. Um, you know, there are other factors involved. But from a television standpoint, this is a growing market. It's one of the few areas of California that people are actually coming to instead of leaving from. So it's a growing area. And they really do, from a football perspective, captivate viewers, listeners from, you know, Kern County and Bakersfield all the way up to Sacramento. That's also their primary recruiting ground. So it's a very large geographical area. Um, and, and there really is a dedication there. Again, as I said earlier, they're distinct from other parts of the state. So I, I think if you're one of those people who's looking at, you know, what teams to add to my power conference, while there are some knocks against Fresno State, the facilities need to be upgraded. School's working on that. The community's going to need to make that happen as they have in the past. You know, you can say academically, it might not have the prestige of Cal and Stanford. But the state of California has also put limitations on that. To this point, Fresno State's been prevented from offering doctoral degrees. I think they're trying to change that. I know they're trying to change that. So I think if you're, if you're evaluating from a power conference standpoint and saying this year, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there are some cases that, to be made for Fresno State. And one of the cases I like to make, just because of my unique role and what I get to do, I mean, some of my you know best memories as an announcer are calling it when Aaron Judge hits a ball 500 feet against Stanford and the number one team in the country, right? Uh, calling it when Derek Carr throws a touchdown to Devontae Adams, and now those guys go out and do what they do. They're pro bowlers in the NFL. You know, calling it when Paul George throws down a dunk at St. Mary's at midnight, and you know now he's one of the best players on the planet. So... All those guys, find another school that has, you know, that collection, that fearsome foursome that I just listed, that is at the top of their game professionally. So that's something that's significant, I would say, right? And those people then represent your conference too. Those people can help Fresno State grow. So to me, there's just a ton of potential at Fresno State that when and if a power conference says, yeah, come join our place, it's only going to get better. And then again, maybe that's what some schools are afraid of. They don't want to see Fresno State turn into what the Bulldogs could be. Uh, and in many respects, they're already there. So I know this fan base would support it if Fresno State got that opportunity. That's what they're all hoping for. And games like the Arizona State game you've been talking about is another chance to make that case. It's another chance to put that feather in the cap. My partner on my broadcast is Pat Hill, the head coach here for 15 years, who famously said, Anyone, anytime, anywhere. That's who he was willing to play. And it was almost like the old days of you hang a scalp, right? I mean, he the entrance to his football office on either side of the wall were helmets of the big-time teams that he had beaten. And people here remember that. And they know that if Fresno State is one of those conferences where every conference game is one of those teams, they're very confident that Fresno State would be competitive. So I hope we get to see it. I hope when the dust settles that, that Fresno State has that opportunity because I know it won't be squandered.